everyone. I'm, hi there, I'm Lynn Jeffrey. I'm a research director at the Institute for the Future and the program director of Foresight Essentials. And this panel is called Futures After Fires. It's a panel about what it's like to live through unthinkable fires and what the future looks like when you have. And just to provide a little context for the panel, IFTF and most of our research staff are located in Silicon Valley in the larger Bay Area. And many of you listening and viewing, you might either live here or perhaps you visited. Um, many people think of the Bay Area as a place where you go to pre-experience the future. And today we are pre-experiencing one of the futures, which is uh, the impacts of climate change and in particular wildfires. And one of the things you might not know if you haven't spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley is about the more rural communities and smaller cities just on the other side of the Santa Cruz Mountains all along the Pacific Ocean. And this is where I've lived since the early 1980s in Santa Cruz, California. And most of the people who come here come here for the ocean and the forests. And one of the things that we don't get very often here are lightning storms. But that's what happened just about exactly one month ago, August 16th. I was on the East Coast and I was getting all of these photographs and texts from people in the middle of the night saying that there was this incredible lightning storm and people were excited about it because it was so rare. And then almost immediately the fires started and they're still going on almost a month later. They've burned down almost 85,000 acres. They have burned down almost a thousand homes. Uh, one man has died and thousands have been evacuated. And now because of the smoke from multiple fires around the state, things have gotten much worse than they were even a month ago. So we thought it was important to pause and give all of you a snapshot of what it's like to live in what will likely be the future for more places in the world over the next decade. And to help us process this unthinkable present, as Jane was talking about earlier this morning, um, the two people we've invited today are uniquely qualified to help us do this. Um, both of them have suffered tragic losses um, because of the fire in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And both of them are dedicating their lives to the future of our planet one of them to the oceans and one of them to the forests. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Jake Dunnigan to give us a little more uh, uh, opening and then we will be hearing from our guests, Wallace J. Nichols and Diego saez Gil. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Len. I'm really glad to be here, I'm part of this conference all week and part of this panel in particular. Um, I, you know, I think we've all, been struck, hit, hit, uh, affected by the events in our world, um, environmental, political, um, all of them are kind of hitting us uh, with a presence maybe that they haven't had before um, and, and a combination of which we haven't seen before. And so as futurists, you know, we're, we're always trying to prepare for different outcomes, good or bad. Uh, uh, and, 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 and mentally, um, uh, you know, mentally preparing, physically preparing strategy, all of those things, but emotionally, uh, sometimes it's very hard. It's, and it's been hard, I think for a lot of us to see the tragedies that are stacking up on each other in recent times. And it also feels unsettling in, in that there's no safe place in, anymore. If there ever was, uh, that we are, uh, that 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 the future is hit, is hitting us right now um it, it, where we live literally and so i'm happy to be here happy to have this discussion about what 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 is the future of mindset what does um you know foresight give us and how do we think through these things and so we're going to process that together uh, in this panel and i'm extremely happy to have both uh jay nichols uh and diego saez gill uh, with us to talk about their experiences um, and, uh, and, 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 and to give us some words of, of how they personally are dealing with things uh, and thinking through these things and, 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 and inspire us, um, influence us, uh, educate us um, about how they've processed it. Because I think, I think we're all gonna be going through this at some level 
um, I'm afraid, um, uh, one way or the other. So we need to learn how to do this and we need to learn how to, to, to process, cope, and, and still think about the future. We still need, the future still needs to pull us toward something better. So we're gonna uh, have Jay first, and, and Jay, let me introduce him. He's a longtime uh, friend, uh, colleague. We have bonded over uh, neuroscience. <laughs> we bonded over the ocean. Uh, we bonded against uh, plastic pollution. And uh, you know, I've watched Jay uh, and his tireless work advocating for uh, marine animals, for marine life, for the environment. Um, for a better world um, for all of us and um, a, a continuing inspiration. He's the author of a book called Blue Mind about the, the, uh, the ways that uh, the ocean, uh, the neuros, neurological effects, the positive effects of being around water uh, has on us. I highly recommend that. Uh, and second up will be Diego uh, Saez Gil. Uh, he is a entrepreneur. Um, he's founded many companies uh, in different uh, domains. Most recently, he uh, has created a, a, a company called Pachama, which is looking at uh, uh, using machine learning and satellite imaging to monitor uh, carbon capture by forest. So, um, you know, building a forest carbon market, um, uh, scaling the kind of industrial investments that are needed to protect uh, and, and enhance uh, forest environments. Uh, and so, uh, we have oceans represented, we have forests represented, uh, we have the future represented. And uh, I want, it, want us to begin with just the story, what happens? Um, uh, how do these fires affect you? And then we'll come back with Len and all four of us, and we'll talk about what this means, how to process, how, to, how, to, how does the future's lens play uh, in this zone? So uh, please, Jay, uh, over to you. Great. Thanks, Jake. Um, it's always great to connect with the Institute for the Future. <laughs> with you and Len and now Diego. I always learned so much um, through our, all of our conversations. So, um, so I just wanna, I'll explain a little bit about what I, what I do or what I've been doing, uh, a little bit about our home, place that we lived for the past decade and, uh, and uh, or 22 decades, and then a little bit about the fire. So uh, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm a marine biologist. I, I fell in love with water and the ocean at a very young age decided to devote my life and my career to a better understanding of the ocean, uh, ocean wildlife, and in order to do my best um, to help the ocean be safer and healthier. Um, the last 10 years, I've focused on something called Blue Mind, which is sort of connecting the neuropsychology community with uh, the ocean, lake, and river, and water communities uh, to change the value equation. So, the basic idea is that we've undervalued our waters and oceans, and as a result, we've let them degrade. And by bringing in the cognitive, emotional, psychological, social, uh, spiritual, and creative wellness benefits, um, we can change that equation. So that's the project I've been working on, which informs my perspective on this fire uh, or these fires. Um, so the house that uh, home, the house that we built became our home. We chose that location, uh, as Lynn described, this beautiful area where the uh, forest, the redwood forest, meets the ocean. We chose that area after literally trekking from Oregon to Mexico uh, down the coast. It took us four months, um, 1,800 kilometers, and we chose what we refer to now as the slow coast. Uh, north of Santa Cruz, um, west of Silicon Valley for our home. And we built very deliberately a house of up, upcycled, reclaimed wood and materials, windows, uh, our family antiques, old rugs from my grandmother, um, a lot of musical instruments, good food, a nice fireplace, um, and just a work in progress, but really um, every knob and every switch and every, every light was chosen mindfully. Um, and we love that place and we shared it with a lot of people, thousands of people through the years, literally. And uh, we lost it um, in, the, in the fires that were lit by uh, that 
those lightning strikes. And um, uh, I'm, I'm still trying to understand that experience, but I was working that night uh, that the fire took the house. I was working on the plaster, I was working on the house, preparing to do, you know, some maintenance and evacuated in time, uh, got the dog out and very little else, actually. Um, our daughter had left for college the night before. Um, and so I needed to inform Grace and Dana, um, my wife, that the house was gone and I tried to do that through a phone call and I, I wasn't able really to get it to communicate verbally so I defaulted to my preferred uh, mode which was writing and wrote a letter to my daughter uh, Grace about her home and um, I think that's um, uh, that was the hardest thing I've ever done so I think I'll just leave it at that for, for the moment uh, and invite Diego to share his uh, experience. Thank you, Jay. Um, well, uh, my name is Diego Saez Gil. Uh, I was born and raised in Argentina, um, actually very close to the Junga Forest, which is the last tip of the Amazon rainforest in the south of South America. Uh, my grandparents had houses in the in the mountains surrounded by forests. So I, all my childhood summers I spent playing in the forest uh, of Argentina. And then life uh, led me to uh, leave Argentina to uh, study in Europe, in Spain, after two years living in Barcelona, I came to the US and in New York, uh, decided to become a technology entrepreneur, started a, a technology company trying to bring innovation to the travel industry. And um, after many years working on, on tech, I uh, decided to switch my focus to, to climate change and to, and to work on specifically uh, working on helping protect and conserve a forest uh, this idea actually came after I, I went back to South America and I saw the deforestation and the fires happening in the Amazon rainforest. And I was uh, uh, struck by the fact that uh, so little money was going to forest conservation and restoration as a solution to climate change. So I decided to, to move from New York to California and similar to Jay in a road trip, uh, discover the small towns in the Santa Cruz mountains surrounded by this beautiful redwood forest and decided to buy a house there. And that was about uh, three years ago. And from that house, I um, decided to start this, this company called Pachama that uses technology to, to help measure uh, and conserve forest. And um, yeah, here's, here's a photo of, of the house. Um, and uh, that house was, you know, similar to Jay, a place in which I share uh, so many incredible moments with uh, friends and family, and with my early team members. This is the temple where this where this company came from. And um, a couple of weeks ago, I decided to take vacation after a long time without vacation, and went camping to Oregon. And as I was camping with my girlfriend in Oregon, I received uh, a text message from a neighbor uh, asking me, hey, uh, have you been evacuated already? And I'm like, why? And, and I learned through that text uh, because I decided to disconnect, you know, not read Twitter and, <laughs> and emails that week. I learned through that friend that there were fires raging on the Santa Cruz mountains. And then next day I, uh, hear from my friend that the fires are actually near my street, um, near Big Basin. And so I started to head back as fast as I can from, from, from Oregon. And then on Friday, uh, the next day, I arrived until the very last second. I don't know what happened to my house. And, um, and, and as I enter my house, I discover that the house is completely gone, uh, down to ashes. And since I had left for vacation, I didn't have the chance to take anything uh, out of it. So in that house was uh, all my souvenirs from Argentina, all the art from my grandma and my brother, who's an artist, 
uh, my passport, my green card, and all my paperwork, everything completely gone down to ashes in, in one day. It was so fast. Um, and yeah, uh, similar to Jay, I'm still processing it and trying to make sense of all this, but um, um, I took it as a, as a renovation of my determination to work on climate, uh, to uh, dedicate my life to, to protecting and restoring forests, which are a big part of the solution to climate change, but also a big part of, of the problem, because unfortunately climate change is going to continue uh, increasing the, the probabilities of fires in the forest all over the world. Um, so yeah, um, trying to convert this loss into uh, a catalyst uh, for me and for others uh, so that we all work together on this important mission. Um, I'll stop there. Great. So let's <clears throat> let's get all of us um, back together on the screen, and we can have a conversation. Um, I would love people to put questions in the chat along the way, and we will circle back to those at the end. But I'd like to start with um, the reason why we wanted to do this. The reason why we we it occurred to us um, to put this together was really because of the incredibly powerful. Uh, pieces of writing that both of you produced um, in the immediate aftermath of losing your homes. Um, uh, Jay, you wrote a letter to your daughter, as you said, the way that you were able to communicate the loss, um, which was uh, published in Outside Magazine and, and, and elsewhere around the world. Um, and Diego, you wrote a piece on Medium called On Losing Everything to the Climate Crisis Except for Hope. And I'd love to, maybe we can start with you, Diego. I'd love to hear how it was that you turned to writing and tell us a little bit about what you wanted to communicate and what you felt in that, in that, in that piece of writing. And then Jake, I'd love to hear the same from you. Sure. Um, yeah, so I had several family members and friends who were waiting uh, from me to hear the news of whether the house uh, had gone or not. And as I was driving back from seeing the house completely burned, I started sort of like uh, thinking on how I was going to tell everyone that my house was gone. And also I was kind of like going through all the lessons learned on my own spiritual journeys. You know, in, in, the, in recent years, I had gotten into meditation and uh, gone deep into the Buddhist teachings and also on philosophy, the philosophy of the Stoics. And, um, and also I had spent some time with indigenous teachers in South America in the Amazon rainforest. So in that time, as I was driving my car, all these teachings came to me. And in a way I felt, okay, this is a moment in which all these teachings come to play to, to keep me uh, stay strong. And I, I kind of like went through a list of all these teachings, the teachings of impermanence, the teachings of non-attachment, the teachings of uh, knowing that material things uh, come and go and what actually matters is a love and relationships. And, and then finally, the teaching of, you know, taking this as an opportunity to learn and grow and to double down on my personal life mission. So as soon as I arrived to my girlfriend's apartment, I went and I wrote, a, a, a note, you know, coming from my heart that was intended to you know, really just go to my friends and family, and and I put it on on, on Medium, and and yeah, the, the the note ended up kind of going viral, and more than twenty thousand people have read it. Um, and you know, in a, in a interesting way, that note is is kind of like a reminder to myself uh, when 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 it's, when it's becoming difficult, I go to that note to say, okay, what what are the teachings I'm I'm trying to to tell myself to to stay strong. So yeah, that was important. Sorry, just say one more little bit about what the, the title, which is losing everything except for hope. So you still yeah. do feel you still, you know, t tell us a little bit about the, the hopeful part of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, clearly these days is very easy to see uh, the difficult situation we're in and the climate the scenarios that climate scientists have been painting for a long time, they're coming very real uh, in our faces right now. And yet I think that we have time and scientists also believe we have the 20s and the 30s, key decades for us to act 
on, of course, moving away from fossil fuels, but also on transforming civilization and really uh, coming together on the projects that we need. Massive reforestation being one of them, but ocean conservation as well. So many efforts that we can do. And humanity has had uh, in the past the ability to come together in moments of crisis. So I don't lose hope. I think that this is a moment of catalyst uh, action and and I wanted to send that message. I was feeling, uh, you know, I, I, I have a lot ahead of me personally and humanity has a lot ahead of ourselves. So, so it's a moment to accept the losses, but also to look at the future with, with urgent hope. Mm. Thank you. Jay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very similar. I'm, it's uncanny how uh, Diego and I have shared a shared a life path, and then now this last month, um, you know, through the fire, uh, and so many parallels. Uh, and I had a similar response. I had a lot of emotion. I, it um, kind of precluded speak speaking out loud, and I like writing, so I I turned to words and. Um, fortunately, I wasn't driving as I was writing. I was sitting and I was crying through every I, through every word I wrote, and it just flowed. And uh, you know, and, and lots of wisdom, traditions, and ideas, and things you've heard your whole life that almost feel like cliches when you're not standing in the fire using them. At, you know, as your as your shield and your armor, uh, but I didn't. You know, I wanted to really focused on our daughter who's eighteen, and the fact that she had literally just left home. You know, as an adult, and her home burned down, and um, knowing her struggles to get where she is now. And wanting to give her, uh, you know, some some way to hold this loss, uh, and encourage her not to come right back home because home was going to look very different to keep going. And so, I tried to convey to her that her home did its job very well. Um, that the you know the the stone and wood and plaster and musical instruments and the people that we shared uh, our home with, we all built her in a way. Uh, and to hold that, hold the memories, hold the memory of the creek and the redwoods and the ocean and the food and the you know, plum tree that burned uh, and our animals, um, the wildlife, all of it, and just tried to convey that in a way that she could get a handle on the loss and show up for class the next day, literally, uh, as strong as she possibly could. And um, uh, so, yeah, that's that was the impetus for writing. And, and like Diego, I, you know, I, I was encouraged to share it. And then in sharing it, it, it helped others, um, not necessarily who lost anything in their fire, in this fire, but who may have lost something in a different kind of fire uh, or just processing the grief related to the loss of, of trees and landscape and wildlife and, um, and the climate. There's a lot of grief around and people are um, looking for ways to get through it. Um, and so um, a personal letter, I, you know, I remember, th this is one of those things that comes to mind. Um, remember somebody teaching me that the most personal is the most universal. Mm. And so I wrote very personally and very specifically and in a very detailed way without an attempt for writing a, a universal prose. And I think what happens in that deeply personal moment is we do express very universal truths. Uh, I got that same feeling from from what Diego wrote, um, very personal, it, about as personal and intimate as you can be. And in doing that, so universal and so useful to humans, uh, all humans. So 
um, that's what kind of what comes out and everything. When you lose everything, you know, the essence of hope, the essence of love, the essence of um, clarity in a way. So I'm going to jump in and I, I, I was going to ask a question of my own, but I, there's one from Marina Gorbis, uh, our executive director that I want to you, um, put in now because I think it connects with what you're saying. And she asks, um, I'm wondering if we're so doomed to a kind of chronic state of grief as so many constants in our lives can disappear at a moment's notice. Can we make this impermanence into a new norm without having it, it without having huge psychological impacts or negative impacts, I suppose. You both mentioned impermanence. You both kind of like Jay in the in one of the stories that was on the news, you mentioned, you know, kind of a, a, a Buddhist uh, um, you know, a relationship to materiality and the impermanence of those things. So you've both gone to kind of deep deep time, deep sort of spiritual truths to try to make sense of what's happening in the present. I wonder if you could speak to that idea of, you know, are we, are, are we set for a chronic state of grief or, or how do the coping mechanisms help us deal with that if, if it's going to happen more and more? I, you know, I'll, I'll start and then turn over to Diego. I, th I think, um, yes, uh, that's the answer, the short answer. Uh, there's an, there's a lot, to grieve about there's there's uh, i think you know even in the pandemic we're, we're all whether we realize it or not we're all grieving the loss of our our predicted future our hope for future at least for the these months and co maybe coming years and there's there's some grief in that of course when your home burns uh to the ground with everything you've collected in your life in it you grieve that um the loss of lives of loved ones, whether related to the pandemic or not, is another source of grief and, you know, places that our heart is connected to, whether the forests or the oceans and lakes and the rivers. Um, and so I'm not imagining we will escape the human emotional condition that allows us to grieve anytime soon as a species. I hope not. Um, and I doesn't look like we're going to get out of this, um, set of crises, um, tomorrow or next year, uh, in terms of finding all the solutions and enacting them and fixing everything that is broken. And so, um, and I really wouldn't recommend just medicating yourself out of your emotions. That's, uh, some people choose that path. I, I think, um, walking straight into the emotions you feel, um, connecting with people who have some experience and some expertise in um, managing your emotions healthy in a healthy way, uh, and learning. You know, as Diego so eloquently said, you know, finding the hope and finding the renewal in it, and not in a cheesy bumper sticker, meme way, but in a real deep way that uh helps a lot of people and helps to fix what's broken uh, and that's really interesting it's a really it's i as heartbreaking as it is i would say it's it's uh, a fascinating place to sit uh and think and create yeah. Yeah, that resonates a lot with me. And I agree with Jay. I mean, there is going to be a lot of loss in the coming decades. Uh, we're going to have to prepare to say goodbye to uh, the icebergs. We're going to have to say goodbye to so many species that are dying out. And, and fires and other natural disasters are going to continue to be, uh, unfortunately, a frequent occurrence it's in, in, the, in the 20s and 30s. Uh, even if we stop burning fossil fuels tomorrow by a magical uh, spell, we, we still uh, have a lots of suffering in front of us. So we had to prepare for that. And in the, in the midst of that, we also had to find ways to act. And we had to find ways to keep moving forward. Because otherwise, the losses are going to be bigger in the 40s and 50s. So I think that uh, I also like a lot the work of Joanna Macy, she wrote a book called Active Hope, in which she talks about 
this 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 dual move of looking at reality in the face without denying anything being able to take it in grief accept your emotions and yet then act and walk even even if if it if it looks dark or cloudy in front of you and i think as a humanity that's something we we absolutely have to learn to do in in the coming decades um yeah thank you um we actually have a phrase i think which was coined by our colleague jane mcgonagall which is urgent optimism that we accept the urgency uh, but we generate the optimism and we 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 we, we feed off the optimism we need the optimism um i wanted to just turn for a minute to this concept of the of being future ready which is what we've been really what this whole week is going to be about and i'm wondering um you both have you know, founded and led organizations. Um, you're working at organizations now. Um, what, 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 what does it mean? What does that term mean to you today to be future ready? And, you know, how, how might you answer that question differently today than you would have one month ago? You know, the, one of the insights I've gotten from the many different organizations I've worked with or for over the past several decades is um, referred to as the, you know, the starfish or the sea star model. And, and there's a species of starfish, not to go too geeky into the marine science, but there's a species that um, if you pull it apart into many pieces, uh, you know, in order to maybe if you're, if you're trying, if you think it's a pest and you want to keep it out of your fish traps, um, you're only creating more sea stars. So every piece that you may pull it apart into, regrows the other parts and becomes yet another sea star. So if you chop this sea star into five pieces, you've just propagated uh, just, you know, a, a whole bunch of more sea stars. And that idea that building our organizations to fall apart beautifully, uh, it's hard to do. And it's it, most people don't want to think about their organization falling apart or their family falling apart or their life falling apart or their home uh you know their team but it, it's inevitable and if you plan for it to fall apart beautifully uh and with some sort of foresight it's it's an amazing thing so that's one concept that i held prior to this fire and and I guess I'm holding it more closely now. The, the insight, I think, the big insight right now for me is that this idea of resilience um, only makes sense um, in contrast to the opposite of resilience. So it only makes sense in the face of utter burnout and uh, uh, crashing. You know, So the concept of resilience is pointless and doesn't make any sense if we're all super resilient all the time and we live in a resilient world where everybody's super resilient you don't even need the word uh it makes most sense to me now resilience makes sense to me now and i do not feel resilient i do not feel strong i do not feel creative i feel very weak i feel very gray i i feel um like a sea star that just got chopped up uh, and thrown back into the ocean and in a thousand pieces, not just five. So uh, I, don't, I don't want to be like gloom and doom and sad about my own life, but it's that, that's, I think the resilience is understandable only in contrast to not resilient. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you can't, there is no permanent resilience. You know, that's, it's a temporary state like everything, I guess. Diego, how about you? you yeah, you know, this year, uh, my company that is a, a very young company still, you know, we, with COVID, we had to move to being fully remote, which I think was the case with, with most organizations around the world. And we are uh, having to look you know, our work is looking at satellite images of the, fo of the forest, right? So we have to look at 
at fires and, and deforestation around the world on a daily basis. And what I believe strongly about organizations in the future is that we will need safe space for vulnerability, vulnerability of every single person and leaders especially will have to lead with, uh, by example, with vulnerability in which each person can show up with their emotions, with their weaknesses, and um, a wholeness that wasn't seen in corporate America in the 80s and 90s and 2000s and even today, right? I think that, that is the level of uh, truthfulness, transparency, and um, honesty that's going to be required for organizations to be resilient and to thrive. And then secondly, I do believe that uh, future organizations are going to be purpose driven uh, in a world that is becoming, you know, uh, full of so big problems. If your company is working on, on people clicking on ads, it's going to be hard to retain talent. So unless you have a, a big transformational purpose, uh, your organizations likely is not going to have the resources to thrive. Um, these are the two things that I, I observe right now. Great. We're, we're nearing the end, but I wanted to ask one more question. There's a lot of questions coming in, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of consolidating some of these, and you've answered uh, different ones already. But one of the things we try to do as futurists is uh, to get ahead of, of, of change is to help people see, right, but also feel in their bones and their guts what the, what the future might feel like. And uh, you know, I'm I'm wondering, having gone through this experience uh, and 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 know, knowing what it feels like to live through this, I'm, I'm I'm sort of interrogating our own practice. Is there even a way for us to pre-experience or feel that that kind of emotional connection, or even a simulated version of that? Would that would 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 you have thought about the future differently had you pre-experienced this um, than having gone through it, or or do we always have to learn? the hard way sometimes about things. I, I wonder what, how you think about um, if, if, if you'd had some sort of pre-experience or pre-knowledge of this, would it even made a difference uh, compared to what you actually went through and, and, and the changes that could have happened on the back end of that? I, you know, I think um, you're referring to Diego's writing and the letter I wrote to Grace uh, and the response that we've both gotten from people who have taken time and read and reread words, meaningful words from people who wrote them literally in the ashes of their life. Uh, I would, I would encourage people to find those texts and maybe poems and songs and works that they're not necessarily, necessarily the, the quick ones or the well-produced ones. You know, they're not the tweets <laughs> of mm. the world, not the snacks, but the, the passages and read them slowly and quietly, mm. read them to each other and then reread them and, and talk about them. I think that it's very low tech. <laughs> you can do it um, by candlelight, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, you should, and, you, and, and that's one of the lessons maybe that, uh, has come out of the pandemic as well for a lot of people is to, you know, go back. <laughs> I keep referring it to the seventies because that was, I was alive then. <laughs> go back to the seventies when we didn't have internet, we didn't have, things were maybe a little slower and people delivered food, delivered milk to your house and uh, read to each other and, and think, um, you know, think and talk about these things about, um, loss and the, and empathize. Uh, uh, I think that's, you know, reconnect with the nature that's available. Um, but, you know, I, I was reminded of um, an interview I did when, when Grace was very young and at the end of it, uh, it was for a documentary. We talked about raising children to fall in love head over heels with nature, just to completely fall in love like with all, every cell in their body, knowing that they're, that falling in love like that is going to lead to heartbreak. Knowing that. And I remember having that 
conversation. Uh, and it was Leo DiCaprio's uh, documentary, The 11th Hour. Not that that matters, but, um, and uh, you know, it's just, I, that came back to me and, and Grace's heart is broken, not just because of her home, but because of the trees and the wildlife in the creek. And, uh, and that will someday make her stronger because she was so in love with her trees her creek that she's made of, literally. And so we have to do that. And we, we can't, I don't think people will fall in love through, through virtual trees. I think we need to fall in love with trees and water uh, and the sound of owls at night, not virtual owls and virtual trees and virtual water. Um, so let's do that. Like, I, every chance we get, help people fall in love with each other and our home um, and have their hearts broken and have their hearts mended. Um, I guess that's, does that make us future ready? <laughs> no. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Diego, any last comments on that or anything else uh, that you want to leave us with? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more with Jay. I was going to say also that uh, in my case, you know, I uh, before moving to the Santa Cruz Mountains, I, I spent some time in the Amazon rainforest, sharing some time with some indigenous communities there that live in a very simple way, but very connected to nature. That time in the Amazon rainforest to me was very important on, on learning a lot of lessons that uh, come handy today. And then even here in the Santa Cruz Mountains, I remember I did some uh, campings in the big basin park that now burned down, uh, in which I went without a tent just to sleep, you know, on uh, completely on the outdoors. And those experiences of uh, being on your own, on nature, uh, are very powerful to know who you are. And and then, as, as Jay said, to, to fall in love with what's precious on this planet that we must protect and, and knowing that, that, that there's going to be a lot of loss as well. Um, I think that, that personally, I think is, is, is super important and in my, in my case has helped me a lot. Um, and as Jay said, that, will that make organizations make uh, future ready? I don't know, but um, definitely will will probably give us a heart that we need uh, to face these times. Thank you both. I, I mean, I think the, the takeaway for me, <laughs> a lot of, uh, of course, powerful things. I'm, I'm trying to hold back tears, but also um, uh, not, not answers, <laughs> really, uh, you know, which I'm okay. I, need to, I think we all need to sit with that, but um, some inklings of it with connecting to deep time connecting to deep present, <laughs> you know, the things that are around us, touching it, um, the people that are around us, um, and, you know, those traditions, but also the future. So for, you know, for me, I'm thinking, um, I fell in love with the future sometime in my past uh, with that, that set of possibilities. And I feel like it's being ripped away in some ways. So trying to love the future, while it, I know it's going to break our hearts, <laughs> break my heart, uh, is is a contradiction that I'm trying to process. Uh, but this 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 was helpful on that front, and just just a, a, a powerful moment for us to take a breath and think about where we are as people, and then you know those universals, you know that that we talked about there, and put it all together, and and hopefully go forward with some. Some, some motivation, determination, <laughs> if it is resilience, is that what it is? Or if it, you know, whatever we need to make the better a better future. And, um, you know, I think, I think the ingredients of that are, are in this conversation that we had. Um, so I, I just really appreciate your time. I'm sorry for the, the experience that you've been through, but you've, you've, you've uh, expressed it so well. And I think we're all better for it from, from hearing your stories and, and sharing that and, and thinking about the future we're gonna build together. So thank you both. And Lynn, Lynn had to, let me just mention, she had to jump off uh, to prep for the next one, but um, I know she feels the same and, and we're just extremely grateful for you for joining us today. Thank you so well, much. Yeah, thank you, Jake. Thank you, Diego and, and Lynn, the whole uh, IFTF team down the scenes there. Thanks a lot.